want to welcome everybody to day two of the PKD RRC annual symposium. Glad you're here. Hope everybody's doing well. I think we have a pretty exciting uh, lineup coming up um, just as ways of kind of business or information we need to take care of. Um, I just want to stress that the, the goal for the PKD RRC is to develop and share innovative resources uh, that will accelerate the pace of discovery in cystic kidney disease. And then this is a partnership. We require your help. Um, would really love to have community feedback on things that you think um, that we could build that would help not just your research, but the whole field in general. Please reach out to us um, and share your ideas. We were, we're here to help. Kind of an overview for the second day. Um, it begins out with a series of talks on new techniques um, that are applicable to cystic kidney disease research. Um, follow that up with a couple talks on, on new discoveries in polycystic functions. We take a short lunch break, come back, and we talk about mechanisms of, of cystogenesis. And throughout this, we're going to have um, trainee uh, abstract talks. Um, but again, I want to stress that we rely on your feedback or new resources that we need to be to generate um, in order to accelerate the, the pace of discovery. Kind of housekeeping, uh, we're on a pretty site schedule. Um, and so everybody will be muted when they come on. Um, no cameras except for the speakers, the panelists, the, uh, and the session chairs. We'll handle questions through the, the chat, submit them, um, and the, the session chair will uh, kind of oversee the, the question and answer period. Again, we're on a tight schedule. Uh, we will give speakers a two-minute warning coming up to uh, to the end of their talk. Um, if you have technical issues, can't get on, can't hear, whatever, um, through the chat, please contact John Hare and Nicole Reed. They will hopefully solve all problems that we have. Uh, after the session today, uh, the, the, the symposium today, we have a trainee-led and organized workshop uh, at about noon, John will be sending out a link uh, for access to that. So if you have registered, you should get that link. Uh, if you have not yet registered, you can still do so. Uh, please reach out to Nicole. Um, we'll get you on the list. I think it's going to be a, an informative uh, workshop. Um, at the end of this, we will send out a survey. Uh, it's really important for us uh, to get your feedback. Again, not just on you know, what he didn't like, but that's important too, but you know, what worked and what didn't. Um, and if you have any ideas on new resources, uh, reagents and so forth that need to be developed. Um, we'd love for have you to get involved. Um, this only works if you help participate and that, you know, visit our website on there. You're going to find a lot of information about the pilot and feasib feasibility program that we have at the annual symposium, which is going on today. We have a monthly science uh, round table where we give have innovative talks uh, that will be starting up again soon, but really want to encourage community engagement in the, in the center. Um, your help is, is desperately needed. Follow us, please, on Twitter. I guess that's now called X, right? It's not Twitter anymore. Um, sign up for our, our mailing list so you can stay informed of things that are going on. And there's a discussion board up there that really is underutilized, but we would love to have uh, a more active discussion um, about what's going on in the PKD research. You know, this was a lot of work to put on. Um, so I wanna give a, a thank you to all the speakers, the session chairs, the moderators, panelists, especially to the co the organizers of this symposium, CJ and Patricia. They did a heroic effort in putting this all together. So thank you to the both of them, as well as to the other uh, committee members who helped organize this whole uh, symposium. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Dr. Lassane and Halpern Kunz to introduce the first series of speakers. Um, stop sharing right now. <laughs> Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right. Well, we will um, go ahead and get started. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the first speaker. Um, so our first speaker today is Dr. Jason Gleghorn. He's an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Delaware. 
He leads an interdisciplinary laboratory focused on developing disease models and therapeutics that integrate innate and adaptive immune responses and drug transport with applications in women's health, maternal fetal health, and in congenital birth defects. The title of his talk is Closing the Tech Transfer Gap, Democratizable Modular 3D Microphysiological Tissue Models. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. And I apologize to bring Zoom back up to unmute. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the invite from uh, Terry and Brad. Uh, and I confess I'm an engineer. Uh, so I am, I am not uh, knee deep in polycystic kidney, although I think hopefully uh, the message that I communicate and the things that I'm passionate about will uh, align pretty well with the description of the, the consortium, which I think is, is fantastic to build these tools. So don't have any conflicts of interest. What I do have and what, the way we think about problems uh, are understanding the rules of tissue assembly. Right, and so we do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, throughout my training in my lab, we've developed a lot of techniques to be able to take hydrogels and add complexity and microfluidic channels to be able to perfuse things. We can develop uh, hydrogel formulations that are self-assembling uh, and self-healing. So you can cut these little blocks together, and they basically re-glue into each other. And so that means you can form these complex cellular assemblies if you embed cells in them. Uh, and a lot of this is is termed kind of deterministic engineering. Right, we want to build a structure. Uh, on the other hand, we, we've also done a lot with uh, thinking about uh, self-assembly, uh, the way the embryo does, and understanding how vascular self-assembly creates architecture and structure. And if you understand the rules that guide these processes, you can do different things, like I can control the size of vessels uh, relative to, to other kinds of engineered systems. And so we approach uh, life with these tools, uh, as well as what we think about in terms of the developing embryo. So we work a lot with ex vivo models and we develop microfluidic techniques uh, to be able to ask mechanistic questions. And fundamentally, that's why I'm a little different than most engineers because we do mechanistic biology out of it, albeit with a mechanical uh, tilt on life. So here's an example of a microfluidic uh, lung uh, chamber, in which case we can take a mouse embryonic lung, we can intubate it. And because we can control the fluid through the intubation tube inside the lung versus the pressure outside the lung, that means we can control the transmural pressure and understand how that regulates development. And so my postdoc, I connected the dots between transmural pressure in the developing lung and branching morphogenesis of new airways. So, um, and we, we have a lot of tools to be able to play with these ex vivo systems, to be able to image, to track uh, deformations in tissue and cell movements, as well as fluid movements. Uh, and so we have quite the toolbox of uh, methods. However, um, some of you may know Tom Carroll, so the kidney developmental biologist uh, at UT Southwestern. He came and gave a talk at a Lung Gordon conference where I was at, and obviously I do a lot of lung stuff. He said, I really want a model where we can generate the spatial organization of stromal populations found in the kidney, because it's uh, patterned, uh, along the, the axis of the kidney. And he wanted to be able to investigate how does organization influences uh, nephron progenitor cell epithelial development in a, in a in vitro model. And I said, well, no one's made that type of model before, but like uh, we have a lot of tools that should be pretty straightforward to develop. And his answer, which is, is cutting to an engineer, but very true. Yes, all engineers say that. Uh, we've been trying to make such a model for greater than 10 years and they still don't exist, right? Which I think is a common... Uh, feeling uh, um, on the biologist side, uh, because I think you can see the power of some engineering tools, but the reality is all the things I just talked about that we have a deep expertise in, they're all stupid hard models to do and use and develop. And so therefore that limits um, the system and ability to be able to control the experimental systems to labs like mine, right? And so all of the questions have to be answered through uh, technology and tools that we build. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the answer to this question, because we did come back with Tom and find a solution. And I'll talk about that at the uh, towards the uh, latter half of the talk. Um, but one of the things I think about a lot are, why is there such a gap? Right, So we clearly have a whole bunch of uh, biologists that can do mechanistic studies and can use those tools. Uh, and I think one of the things that's uh, really important to recognize is that uh, for engineers in our community, the reward structure is pretty skewed to making the next flashy thing. Right, We can make all these cool little cartoons that seem really easy to do, uh, but they're not, Right, but they seem intuitively easy. 
And so there's a lot of failure in other people trying to replicate those because there's a lot, there's a lot of tricks, right? Even people who use the IBIDI systems, which are commercialized systems, they're not straightforward, right? So it, it takes a, a learning curve. And the other piece of it is I think research is really good at funding uh, or funding agencies are really good at funding research, i.e. the first generation of a thing, uh, but they're really bad at funding development. That's usually what a company does. So how do I make the system, the first generation system, make it robust so other people can use, right? And uh, the other really big thing, I guess two points are, are uh, points in general that I think about engineers, and you've probably noticed as I'm talking to people, engineers are reductionists, right? Uh, if this looks like that and I can build that, of course I can do this. Right. And the rest is just details. Right. And you give me enough time and money and we can solve that problem. And that, that's a common uh, cultural thing that actually happens. And so, in my opinion, it leads to a lot of overpromising and underdelivery. Right. And I can see some people nodding. Right. Because you've probably had these experiences. So I don't think I'm telling you anything new. But the other piece that I just as an information to your community is to talk about is all engineers are not the same. So the unique skill sets I have are, are distinctly different than most people in engineers that do these kinds of models. And that's largely because I've trained in both engineering, but also uh, I play a developmental biologist on TV and did a, a postdoc in developmental biology uh, in lung development. So in my view, and the thing we've been focused on the last uh, four years or so is trying to figure out ways to make uh, these really complex models much more simple. And that way we can start democratizing them. So I'm going to tell you an example of uh, a, a U19 consortium that I lead um, that's across uh, University of Mar Mar Maryland Medical School, uh, University of Virginia, and University of Idaho, where we're focused on trying to build these organ on chip models of the female reproductive tract. And again, I'm not going to go into too many details because it's kind of irrelevant other than some of the lessons learned that I think I'm starting to apply across multiple systems and what we want to do in the, in the kidney. So in the way we structure this is we roll out a first generation model, right? That other people can use. We learn to translate it into the, the biologist lab as opposed to my engineering lab. And then while that's happening, we build more complexity in the model. And so this generational kind of feature space that keeps adding complexity while still basing it on the same uh, skill sets and tool sets to be able to establish the models are really important. And one of the challenges, everyone uh, may have seen this, right? Like, so the Wiesn Institute is a really good marketing team. So ev everyone has seen the, the organ on a chip is the canonical picture, right? And these are made out of PDMS and you put in a little colored food dye. And again, these are, these are uh, a class of systems that um, these microphysiological models uh, represent. Um, and they have some significant problems, even though, again, they look pretty straightforward. Uh, and people have been trying to figure out ways to, to make them faster and more efficiently. And so there are different approaches like these layer by layer assembly with different uh, layers of tape and plastic. So I can stick all this stuff together and make a, a composite system. And here's the canonical little coin next to the microfluidic device to show scale. But there's some serious problems with a lot of these approaches. One is that the, the main membrane that engineers or the main material that engineers use is called PDMS. PDMS sequesters pretty aggressively hydrophobic molecules. And in our case, if we want to do uh, sex-based research or female reproductive tract, uh, hormones are a really important part of the thing, uh, part of biology. And if your device is sequestering all this and people aren't paying attention in general as a, as a fundamental statement about these model systems of the materials being used, then you can really alter the biology without necessarily understanding the dots, right? And so I think it's really important that biologists talk to engineers as well. The other uh, open secret in the field is that uh, to make these things, the fabrication efficiency is eh, 60 or 80%, like in my lab, like it's complicated to be able to line these things and make them. Uh, and the other piece of it is they're all sealed, which means it makes it difficult to get cells in there, which is part of this fabrication efficiency part. And then how do you do endpoint analysis, right? Like you, you start limiting your, your use case, the ability to be able to analyze these things because of that. So one of the approaches that we've uh, developed uh, pretty recently is this modular approach. So again, this looks complicated, well, because it is, right? I and mean, I'll explain the different steps, but basically we think about um, taking a couple pieces that we can manufacture really straightforward and really quickly and at scale uh, and being able to combine some of these techniques. So if we take all these little pieces and we glue them together, then we can have what we call an insert, which is where all the cells in biology happens. And I'll explain that in a second. And that gets clamped between a bottom plate and a clamshell lid. And if I clamp it correctly, I now have uh, fluid channels. 
right? And so the canonical picture of the organ on a chip device is this cross section where you have this polycarbonate membrane, not like a transwell, which we'll talk about in a second, and you have an epithelial uh, cell layer on top, an endothelial cell layer on the bottom, right? And you have fluid uh, ports, uh, through different fluid uh, channels that will uh, either differentially apply shear stress or convect different reagents or, or, or medias, et cetera. And again, these kinds of systems in this uh, clamped uh, modular format, you can create nice cell layers, mono layers that uh, are, are reminiscent of these uh, systems. But the reality is in order to make something this simple, it requires a lot of complex engineering. Uh, and I won't, de I won't bore you too much of the details, but the, the goal is for us to be able to take these things uh, and have them so that you can have this pretty straightforward cassette system, be able to apply flow to it. And again, here's the canonical putting fluid dye in, and you can have two different channels. And that's the, the system in this uh, device example, where you have an epithelial channel and endothelial channel. So if you are a user, and this is where we're uh, starting to do the translation part, this is your, your uh, total tool set. You get these inserts, which are consumable, and then you have this cassette, which is reusable and some screws, right? And the nice thing is because of this format, uh, we've basically taken and made a transwell. It's a funny looking transwell, but this insert has a polycarbonate membrane in it. Instead of a circle, it looks like a channel, right? And you put fluid, you put cells and fluid in there, just like you would a, a transwell, and you culture it out of the device, which means I can put cells in there. I can organize them really well. I can establish the model and that the complex cellular community fairly well. And then when I want to apply flow, I clamp it in this clamshell, right? And so what does that look like? Uh, pardon my student's non-gloved hand and you use tweezers, right? But you put the insert on uh, the base plate and there's this registration uh, recess in the lid and that aligns things all perfectly. And we design the screws and everything. So it's tolerant such that when you screw it together the correct way, you get closed fluidic ports and interfaces, which means now you can apply flow uh, whenever you want in, in whichever format you want. And the really uh, big win uh, in our mind uh, is this little box here, right? So if you look, there are commercial systems out there um, and this is the rough uh, order of cost. We've been able to figure out how, again, with just efficient manufacturing and other kinds of tricks that we use, uh, the ability to, to put it to about 10% of the cost, right? So now in my brain, this takes it out of the range of pharma who's willing to pay these exorbitant costs, right? And be able to make it as a mechanistic tool. And that's one of the goals of the lab is really to get these things out in uh, the hands of other people. The other advantage is because of this format, it's compatible, we, we design these systems to be compatible with multiple uh, types of assays, right? So you can do longitudinal assays with time-lapse imaging because we put cover glass. And again, I'm, I'm skipping over some of the details, but you can actively uh, capture perfusates at different times. You can do live imaging. Uh, endpoint analysis is really nice because the whole thing unscrews, right? And you can section for histology. You can uh, recover the cells with lysate buffer, et cetera, right? And so it's compatible with a wide range of assays, again, just like you would have a, tra a transwell assay, a transwell model. Um, so one of the things we think about is the cost is pretty good. The use case and the, the way it's organized is pretty good. Um, and so here's a bunch of examples where you can, again, image this in real time, uh, looking at cell proliferation. Uh, this is uh, Huxt imaging and then uh, different endothelial cells. Uh, this is an example of endogenous mucus production. And this is an example of gonorrhea infection. The, the details really don't matter, but the reason I put this is none of this was generated in my lab. So this has all been generated because it's been translated to three different uh, biology labs that are focused on host, host pathogen interaction. Uh, many of them have never used a pump before, uh, and they've been able to take our system and get it up in their lab, and they're starting to do biology on it, right, which we find really exciting. So the initial tech uh, dissemination process and the process we figured out is that it's really an iterative process. We, we create a whole bunch of videos and protocols, we share them. Uh, the lab starts to work on these uh, systems and get it in their hands to develop some of the, the skills and the way you hold things. Uh, and it's an iterative feedback with us until the, the model gets up and running. And usually the way I interact with other groups is uh, we have these kind of first generation models and we're working on a next generation where we're adding other features into the system. So here's an example where, again, we talked about the normal transo, which is a piece of plastic and membrane that separates epithelial and endothelial. Uh, one of the things we really want to do is put in a stromal compartment, so a hydrated gel with 
fibroblast embedded in it. And here's an example where we can create this in our uh, system where you have an epithelial layer and you have fibroblasts, and here's a Z stack. And you can see the, the 3T3 fibroblasts are, are well spread out and they look like a fibroblast would in a collagen hydrogel. So back to Tom, right? Because we worked all these processes out and protocols to be able to do this translation in this interim. And again, he really wanted to try and see this model uh, for the kidney because he's really interested in the stromal population. And so this is generation one. And the goal is for us, I'm gonna show you some data we have on this first generation system and what it can do. And then the goal is to be able to translate it into our pipeline I just showed you in generation two to make it easier and start getting it out to labs. And Brad's lab's already volunteered to be a guinea pig. We have some of our stuff sitting there. So we're starting to do this with this type of model. <laughs> so his goal was to be able to create zones of stroma around a, a common epithelial tube. Right, that's effectively what his question is. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, we've been able to demonstrate is a, you'll see this uh, kind of cartoon in, the, in a bunch of these slides. You have a central perfusible tube, that's your epithelium. And again, I'll go through this in a second. And then uh, you have two different zones, right? So this represents hydrogel region one, which has one color fluorescent beads. And this is hydrogel region two, the different color fluorescent beads. And this is in a collagen uh, gel matrix. And if you look at Brightfield, here's the example where you can see the actual channel, the tube that will be uh, epithelialized when we put epithelial cells in it. Uh, and that's what it looks like in Brightfield. Um, and then this is uh, perfused via two side ports. So I'll get into this in a second. So the way this process works um, is uh, basically around a, a molding uh, approach. So one is we use this uh, weird looking geometry to mold around an elastomer, right? So we can create a recess, uh, which has a smaller channel this way and these larger channels here. And then uh, we place a needle effectively through this long channel, and then we can inject in hydrogel. So if you inject in collagen and it's pre-polymerized state in one area, and then you go through the other port and inject it in the other way, I'll show you this in a second, uh, then you can create a collagen hydrogel that polymerizes around this needle, right? And then if we remove the needle, we now have a channel that we can then perfuse with fluid, et cetera. And so this is the, the base model that uh, is compatible with a peristaltic pump. And one of the things that we started asking questions about, because whenever you have materials and hydrogels of different sizes and properties interface with each other, there's a lot of questions about alignment and uh, molding and reproducibility. And here's an example where you can perfuse in fluorescent uh, particles and track their uh, speed in this case. Uh, and one of the things you figure out, which is good and what we wanted is a nice uh, parabolic flow profile, uh, i.e. pressure driven flow, and it's nice and uniform. Uh, the method is also scalable. So I just showed you one that looked like this first part, but again, you can put these and gang these in series. And here's an example with four different domains patterned along a single uh, central channel. And again, it's no different than just sequentially adding in a pre-polymer. And if you understand the chemistry and you do it correctly, they will anneal uh, across the system. So we can create a hydrogel. We can create this channel by taking out the needle. Last thing we want to do is be able to put uh, epithelial cells in here. Here's an example of uh, epithelial cells in the central channel. Uh, note the size. So this is massive in microfluidic lens, right? We're over a centimeter long uh, epithelial channel. And this is an example of an air bubble that's trapped in there and the epithelium will um, uh, cover that entire domain. And so if you do ECAD and F-actin staining and I start doing a Z-stack through it or a cross section, again, you have a cylindrical channel, which is good because that's what we mold it around. And that's all cellular based. We can again do perfusion uh, in, an, in the cellular channel and get this parabolic flow profile, which means now you can start calculating shear stress applied to your uh, epithelium, et cetera. And then uh, lastly, uh, because we have these sequential gels that we create, we can embed in, here's an example, we put in uh, 3T3 fibroblasts in one region of the gel and not the other. Uh, and you can create these zones, right? Where you have a stromal fibroblast population here and an acellular zone here. What's interesting there is uh, if you do that in the system and you use MDCKs uh, and 3T3s, uh, again, I understand the biology is not correct and we have different species and all these kinds of things. It's an example. Uh, but one of the things we see is that 
in the areas where there's uh, 3T3s along the channel, you locally get these little invasions from the epithelial cells. This happens. Two in minutes. the areas where there's no 3T3s in the channel, uh, we end up uh, having uh, uh, fewer of these individual little sprouting events. And so we can locally control the epithelium phenotype just via the introduction of the stromal population. So we've built a model where Tom can now play with his questions about patterning in different stromal populations. Uh, and then lastly, I think the other uh, thing that we're trying to do is move towards these dynamic uh, questions where we now have our system and pardon the drips, again, preliminary data, but now you can pattern and do interstitial flow to pattern a gradient of a soluble factor, right? So we can position different soluble factors differentially along the length of the tube. And if you have uh, play with the different flow rates in the two channels, you can control this interface dynamically in time, et cetera. Right? So that's where we're kind of uh, moving with some of these dynamics uh, of the, the system itself. So key takeaways for us, we've been really trying to make these models that are democratizable. So take these systems and make these platforms where this is possible to do. And we're trying to take this uh, kidney first generation model and again, make it and fit it into this cassette model, uh, which will speed things up and hopefully allow other users, because that's our goal, uh, to be able to do that, as opposed to us just being a um, speed bump in terms of progress and uh, the ability to get gen data generated. Um, and also is uh, an integrated approach. So I think if you want to do this, just expect that there's gonna be a learning curve and back and forth. And if you are interested in doing that, then A, talk to me, because I'm happy to collaborate and uh, do these things. But uh, I think that's the only way to make these models really accessible and tractable. Uh, and the end result hopefully is that we can get these models out there and democratize and disseminate the information. So that I'd like to thank uh, all, uh, the funding sources and a lot of uh, really ridiculously amazing people that do all the work because I don't do anything, I just think. Uh, and so with that, I can take any questions if you have them. Thank you so much for that incredible talk. Uh, we have one question so far in the chat. Uh, it says, very interesting. Do you know why culturing epithelial cells in the presence of fibroblasts causes the epithelial cells to jut out of the tubule? Yeah, I think it has to do with uh, TGF beta signaling. So there's a couple of different, um, uh, there's, there's definitely a series of, of these kind of multicellular models where you either do conditioned media uh, and that will make an endothelium or epithelial model more robust and, and better uh, in these uh, systems that we are able to pattern in a 3D hydrogel versus a 2D that I was just talking about. Uh, oftentimes the uh, interaction is just generalized RTK signaling, which oftentimes induces some invasive response or branching. Nice talk, Jason. Um, as a, I trained as an engineer as well, and consider myself a practicing biologist now. So <laughs> I uh, appreciate your your commentary on the engineers. Um, our uh, next question in the chat is: Do you reach a full polarization, i.e., with high trans epithelial resistance? Uh, yes. Uh, and so we can measure we can measure tear uh, pretty easily in our system, uh, and that does form an actual. Uh, intact uh, patent barrier. Yep. Uh, we have another question. Does the system have control over the cell numbers delivered between the experiments in the channel? Uh, yes. So I guess it depends on how you define what your what your viewpoint is. Stromal, uh, the stromal density is controlled by the density. So like a tissue engineering approach is you embed X number of cells and X volume of gel. And so you'll get a density uh, with some caveats of like flow and uniformity. Uh, so you can definitely control uh, density of the stromal population. The epithelium, oftentimes what happens is you'll, uh, you'll get it to proliferate just like an endothelium. They'll proliferate and, and uh, form that entire surface and they form a quiescent kind of monolayer. Uh, and there's other tricks where oftentimes you do a trickle flow. So if you guys have ABD systems where you have problems, a trickle flow is usually produced and that will, will generate really strong intercellular uh, connections and make your barrier uh, permeability and function much better. So there's, there's definitely tricks in the system. So you answered part of our next question, but I'm going to oh. ask it in full in case you have more to add. Um, so how long do cells last in the contraption and do they keep dividing or is there contact inhibition after certain rounds of division? 
Yeah, so uh, with the caveat that we haven't played a lot with these stromal cell populations, and clearly there's communication, and clearly there's other things happening there. But in general, uh, you can use an endothelial or epithelial cell line, again, with, with some caveats of all epithelium is not the same. Uh, but these things will will stay in culture. We often use culture in 10 days, uh, two weeks, pretty straightforwardly. Um, most of the time, it's due to termination of the experiment versus a, an actual limitation of the system. So almost all the epithelium and endothelial cell lines that we've played around with, even primary, will, will form a quiescent monolayer. And they're they're perfectly happy to, to hang out once, that, once they proliferate and form that architecture. And then the question is, what's this other signaling that's happening or, or how are you perturbing the system that has some asterisks to how it works? That leads beautifully into our next question. Is it possible to direct or observe cyst-like structures forming in the epithelial cells in response to chemical stimuli like forsklin? Yeah. yeah, so we play a lot with forsklin, uh, as, you might, as you might imagine, because we play a lot with uh, pressure and we want to understand these things. So um, yes, you, you can form uh, cysts in these uh, <clears throat> epithelialized uh, architectures just in general uh, with forsklin or other kinds of approaches we've played around with uh, depending on your geometry. So I published a paper in my postdoc looking at the, the geometry of the container, right? So if you have a, if you start off with a spherical geometry, you you will generate and grow a, a cyst or, or sphere-like uh, asini kind of structure. If you have these kind of pill shapes, which are rectangular and curved, you get other phenotypes because of the mechanical tension within the epithelial tissue. And that causes uh, phenotypic behaviors, preferentially at the tips versus along the, the length. And so there's a bunch of details in there, but you people have used these uh, approaches to be able to investigate these kinds of questions pretty robustly. Great. Um, our next question is what types of perfusion systems such as peristatic pumps can be used with these chips? And additionally, can you comment on the shear stress levels in these models? Yeah, so uh, we, we the, the model, the way we have it is, uh, it does not matter what kind of pump you want to use, right? So every pump has different um, pros and cons, especially at the length scales you care about, right? So um, the difference between a, a, an infusion syringe pump versus a peristaltic pump, the flow rates are going to vary. And again, I can get all engineering and geeky on you, but like uh, the system is set up so we can do either one. Oftentimes, if you want long-term culture, uh, it's set up as a, a peristaltic system, largely because then you can recirculate or you can play other games like that, or uh, the, the traditional kind of uh, pump system, which is pressure-based that Ibidy has, where you can have a syringe-based system, but it basically is able to recirculate is another device that's compatible. So basically we're trying to make as universe as possible for whatever people have, but uh, our goal is to make it on pretty straightforward, simple peristaltic pumps and things that are around, um, and we just adjust the, the fittings. And the, the shear stress is just engineered by the size, right? So we can control the size of that channel and the flow rate, and you have a pretty wide latitude to be able to, to play around with the specific mechanical loading you want from a fluid standpoint. You can also play games like differentially changing the pressure versus the shear, right? Because it's different if you have shear on a high pressure system, system where you oscillate around a magnitude versus a lower one. So there's all kinds of games you can play uh, with the system and the way you fluidically load it to, to tease out and separate the questions. Time. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gleichhorn, for that amazing talk and your um, thoughtful responses to all of the questions. And I think it's time to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Tarek Ashkar. Uh, Dr. Ashkar is the Terence P. Khan Professor of Nephrology at Indiana University. In addition to studying the biology of the protein neuromodulin, he is an investigator in the Kidney Precision Medicine Project and the Human Biomolecular Atlas Program. The aim of this work is to unravel the cellular and molecular pathophysiology of kidney disease through integrating multimodal omics and imaging approaches. The title of his talk is Spatial Analysis at Cellular Resolution to Study Human Kidney Disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashkar. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Well, thank you so much for the organizers uh, for this invitation. It's really a privilege to be here with you. I also see 
uh, many colleagues and friends and young investigators in the audience. So this is really, I'm very thrilled to be uh, to be here today talking about uh, spatial analysis at cellular resolution to study human kidney disease. So uh, there will be a no, even though we spend in the lab half of our time with mice, uh, there will be no uh, mice data presented. Most of the data presented here will be uh, uh, unpublished, uh, but whatever we're, we're talking about could also be applied to experimental models. So uh, spatial analysis uh, is, uh, I think we all recognize that it's indispensable to complement many of the other omics tools that are available. And this is uh, particularly important for the kidney where that has very complex architectures, many cell types uh, that dictate the way things are, uh, dictate physiological and pathological processes. And uh, Technologies such as high content spatial uh, imaging, for example, uh, is key to interpret some of the findings that we're getting from other technologies that dissociate the tissue, uh, such as uh, single cell analysis, for example. And I'm gonna give uh, just two uh, examples why uh, we, we need spatial biology could be very important. First of all, of course, it's obvious is avoiding sampling bias and I like this uh, recent study by uh, Dr. Catalin Sustak's group that just appeared in Jason, where they showed they took uh, samples from different disease models that uh, either from their lab or in the community. And they found that there is the difference in signature between different models is accounted for the different cell proportions that, that are, that are uh, really uh, present in these different models, which is kind of eye-opening in a way. And also even within like single cell technologies, looking at proximal tubules from disease models, it is very likely that there are different proportions of, uh, of for example, uh, tubules or subtypes of tubules that could account also for a differential signature. The other interesting uh, important uh, uh, aspect is really uh, to understand the neighborhood and what are the other uh, uh, interactors. We all know that uh, whoever we interact with, where we live, or whoever we have like for dinner, might uh, tell us, uh, you know, who we are. Might inform a lot about uh, what we do, where we live, and uh, and what where we live matters. And similarly, for cells uh, in the kidney, uh, whom these cells are, or which other cells are they interacting with, in what environment is going to be very important. I think we recently illustrated this uh, in this uh, major paper that came out from KPMP, where, uh, and I'm just showing an example of the imaging here, we use here a multiplex 3D imaging, and we define uh, like 14 or 15 cell classes. And then for each cells, we were able to define the neighborhood, which is cell-centric based on a radius. And with that, we were able to look at uh, statistically, which cells are clustered together, and then we can define the neighborhood composition and see how these are could be altered with disease. And based on that, one could uh, understand a little bit more. So T cells interact with proximal tubule in, in the cortex during injury, whereas macrophages interact with other types of proximal tubule, mostly in the outer uh, stripe uh, of the medulla, et cetera. And I think this is kind of the idea that we're gonna uh, discuss a little bit further. With that, it is not surprising to see there is a conversions uh, of many of the omics tools that are, uh, that are uh, uh, present there to a spatial analysis uh, at the cell level. And uh, I think there's a lot of advances in RNA and protein, and I think metabolites are getting their uh, spatial metabolomics. We will focus on, uh, I was asked to focus particularly on the codex phenocycler technology, uh, a technology for multiplexing, but what we'll discuss today could be also applied to some of the other cool stuff that also some of the investigators here in this consortium are also doing. Uh, so when for highly multiplex imaging, and this is more like a general, uh, if you want a, a workflow of, the, uh, of how we do this, uh, we apply some form of staining with cyclical imaging uh, or other types of imaging, like chemical imaging, for example, and image, uh, imaging mass cytometry. And then we obtain images we do some processing, we segment the nuclei, meaning we isolate or, or the cells, isolate the cells to be analysis ready. And then once these are isolated and actually registered so that they have coordinates and you associate the labels, the, 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 the intensity of staining, the expression, if you want, then one can do uh, some form of a clustering analysis uh, and then labeling of these cells based on their expression profile. The advantage of spatial technologies is that you can always map 
those back to the imaging uh, so we can get really ground truthing of these uh, cell labels that we get. And then from there, we can do a little bit more sophisticated analysis. Now, particularly for the examples that I'm going to discuss here, mostly the codex or now it's known as phenocycler. This is from uh, a technology from Akoya. Uh, where uh, the antibodies are uh, conjugated to a DNA or uh, oli oligonucleotide barcodes. And those have typically complementary sequences that are hooked to, uh, to uh, fluorophores. So you put all the antibodies uh, at once, and then you can apply then the, uh, the uh, appropriate uh, uh, oligos to reveal uh, the particular antibodies uh, here at three at a time. So this will, uh, those will be imaged, and then you can restrip those and then reveal again another set and do this over and over until you get uh, as many antibodies or as many uh, targets that, that you were designing. And of course, uh, with that, it's really important to uh, have the right markers to design specific panels that are informative. So there is a choice that is being made at the beginning to figure out like, what are we looking for? So uh, in our work, we have designed uh, markers that target uh, structural, key structural uh, uh, targets, uh, immune, and also cell state injury targets. And then those were validated. And I think the validation effort is important. And this is, we spend a lot of time, uh, both in all the consortia that we are part of uh, to do that. and. Also, we get inspired or we get information from these ATLAS efforts that are being developed by KPMP, for example, and HubMap uh, to look for new targets to incorporate into our panels. And uh, we are trying to uh, make sure these are released in a way that are available to the communities through the organ mapping antibody panel efforts that are done by HubMap. And this is a link to uh, the latest panel that is uh, released for the kidney uh, codex. And now we, with this technology, we have achieved the high throughput. So two weeks ago, we, we were able to image 12 biopsies in the same time. Uh, and the data was obtained within 48 hours. So the, this technology in our hands, we initially developed it on frozen section because the tissue can be shared with other omics technologies such as single nuclear and space transcriptomics and others. But now recently we have uh, um, uh, developed it also for paraffin, which really gives exceptional quality. And this will likely become widely adopted because of the ease of storing the paraffin tissue, sharing it, and most of the archival tissues that are available. Now I'm gonna talk about four applications uh, uh, for this. Uh, first of all, uh, just from a general discovery exploration, uh, what, what we get when we have this type of resolution at the cell level. And uh, of course, with that comes the effort of Atlas building that will be resources for the community, defining cell types, subtypes, and also cell states. And also uh, looking at how cell neighborhood definition could inform us about uh, changes with disease and how this could be used. And I'll just briefly talk at the end of how uh, just uh, some of the ideas that we're developing of aligning with other spatial technologies. So first we'll start with the discovery aspect. Uh, of course, if we have everything available, we now have the chance to uh, do some form of molecular painting. And this is a, a, a h and &E of, a, of a section from a paraffin section. I think the goal is to get here. Uh, so how are we gonna get there? So I'm just gonna go uh, guide you one by one. So for example, you apply these markers and these are uh, some of the markers that we got, we're gonna show you. So for example, CD31 or PCAM, which uh, will stain the glomerular endothelium, the pertubular capillary networks, the vessels, and then uh, add on it a, a alpha SMA, which will stain vascular smooth muscle and myofibroblast. And you can see some of the vessels and also a few other signals dispersed elsewhere. Uh, you add on it a podocyte marker such as nestin. Now you can see the podocyte and the glomeruli light up. Um, now we add uh, megalin or LRP2, which will uh, uh, mark the proximal tubule. And now you can see we have a definition of the entire tissue as we go along. Let's uh, move to the uh, thick ascending limb with one of my favorite protein, uromodulin, that is marking thick ascending limb. And now you can see some structure forming here. If you notice, that wasn't appear apparent before. And now let's add a marker for the distal convoluted tubule, SLIC 1283. 
and we can see these uh, distal tubule appear in the green now. So now we're starting to have a definition of most of the tubules uh, and also the structure in the kidney. And then let's add cut binding for the connecting segments, uh, which is marking also yet other tubules that are, uh, some of them are localized in the periglomerular space. And then let's add aquaporin two to mark the collecting dot. So this is where what we have, and we can see now we have uh, we labeled uh, most of the structural components, but also we have some interesting organization that that is appearing here. And then if you count these, you you're gonna count at least in this field seven collecting ducts in almost every of these bundles that are fencing these uh, tubules inside. And this is actually uh, an example of how we define the architecture of a medullary ray. Uh, and this is uh, an enlargement of that area, uh, which is quite intriguing if you do this, uh, this, uh, this count. Uh, we're not saying that we, def we are discovering the architecture. Uh, this is from the uh, Selden textbook where we have, this was defined before. I think what we, what we have now is the information that used to be uh, obtained in the matter of, of uh, years is now obtained in the matter of hours. So what we are adding now is we can do the math and we can look at the math and then that will help us look at differences in disease, how this is altered and let us understand what changes are important in health and in disease. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an example of that. Of course, uh, having this type of resolution is also uh, another example is an opportunity to define the immune cell uh, system in, in, in situ. Uh, in the human kidney. So this is a field from the uh, same tissue and we can see that this is an h &E. There are cells here, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, there are cells uh, that are, um, uh, that have a nuclei that looks like immune cells and there are vessels uh, that have red blood cells in them and some glomeruli that have even red blood cells. So now let's see what this looks uh, if we apply the codex technology to a contiguous slide. Uh, I put structural marker first so that we can define the landmarks. We have the glomeruli, some thick ascending limb uh, vessels uh, um, that are apparent, and there are some tubules also uh, there. So uh, I'm adding a CD45 uh, staining, which is marking the pan leukocyte marker. So now we can see that there are some uh, um, leukocytes in the periglomerular space, but also all over the interstitial. Uh, and uh, uh, vascular uh, capillary network uh, in the kidney. So now I'm gonna uh, add a neutrophil marker, myeloperoxidase, and now we can see that there are some neutrophils that are dispersed. Some of them are actually within the vessels, which is expected adhering to the vessel wall, but some are also uh, in the peritubular capillary network. So then adding uh, a, a CD3, which is the pan T cell marker, Will, uh, is showing us now uh, the uh, distribution of T cells uh, across, uh, which is also uh, uh, quite interesting. And then adding a macrophage marker CD206 or the mannose receptor one, show, uh, will also highlighting some of the other uh, leukocytes. And we can see what an extensive network uh, that the immune cells present uh, in the kidney. And with that, we're now able to uh, look more broadly and. Uh, for example, one of the uh, things that we started to understand is that the, the CD206, uh, which uh, in experimental mouse model, people think of it as an M2 marker. However, in the kidney, we're realizing that it really marks most macrophages in the human kidney. And I think uh, uh, one of the things that we're uncovering is that really the network of, uh, and I'm using macrophage in a, in a generic term, it's really mononuclear phagocytes, but it's really marking this uh, network of, of, of phagocytes that is present in the entire kidney. And with that, we are, so far our observation is that in health, we are seeing really a large population that is uh, for these uh, macrophages that is, has CD68 on a low level and also 206. Uh, when we have inflammatory pockets, uh, we see now uh, these uh, inflammatory macrophages that are high in CD68, that are high in CD11C, and that are also still uh, 206 positive. And then we do see an intermediate phenotype where uh, you have a uh, uh, low, low 11C, uh, CD68 positive and 206 positive. And the presence of these 206 is really consistent also with newer data from McAvoy. It's just showing that also a lot of the resident population express uh, 206 uh, that is uh, present. 
Now we recently used this uh, to map uh, the importance of inflammation in, in kidney stone disease and where we showed that uh, uh, calcification present in the papillae uh, of patients with stone disease uh, is really uh, uh, is associated with a very active immune response and, and inflammation and also with a, with a significant matrix remodeling response uh, that, that is there. So now how do we use this effort to, to do atlas building? So if we are doing this type of analysis on, on separate tissue, what we can do is we can uh, put all this analysis uh, into uh, a single analytical space using computational methods. And this is an example of what we've done here with like a handful of biopsies. And then with that, now you can uh, look at them uh, all into a single analytical space and then uh, start to uh, do some cell labeling based on uh, the uh, expression pattern. And then one can label these different clusters that are appearing there based on their, on their markers and then back map them into the image to perform a validation. And this is an example where we did it on a, a small uh, 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 samples of, uh, of biopsies. Uh, to try to understand the different population of tubules. Of course, uh, some of this will be dictated by the markers that one chooses. Now, with that, one can start uncovering the subtypes of cells. For example, in the proximal tubules, we are uncovering some cell subtypes. Uh, interestingly, there is a subtype that expresses a CD90, which is the Taiwan. It's a mesenchymal cell marker that's associated with stem cells that is thought to have a role in uh, in in uh, regeneration and repair, and this is actually quite a uh, interesting po a large population in the human kidney, uh, and we can map that. Uh, and this is again, these are reference tissue. Uh, now, of course, if we want to scale it up and do an atlas for the community, these are part of the efforts that we're doing with HubMap, where this is a a, a section spanning from the cortex to the papilla, and then if we you take several of those and do the analysis and put them all in space. You have so far 4 million cells, and, and this is expanding. We're hoping to get to 10 million. And of course, with when you have so many cells, you can have increased resolution. You can even subtype cells even further. Uh, and a word a little bit about the niches and the neighborhoods. So uh, going back to that reference sample, again, the example that I showed you earlier about uh, un understanding the cell-centric based neighborhood. So one then could... Uh, uh, cluster these uh, neighborhoods that are enriched in different cell types. And then you can look at the neighborhood composition. For example, in reference, you can, uh, this, these are all cortical tissues. You can get the cortical proximal tubular niches and the glomerular niche, for example, that is rich in podocytes. Two minutes. Now, if you want to uh, look at what happened in disease, we can combine the reference and the disease sample uh, together. And this is an example from that small cohort uh, where we combine reference tissue and disease tissue, and you can do the same process and cluster the cells, label them, and then one can look at changes in disease. For example, uh, when we looked at uh, kidney disease, and this is kind of few samples that have various types of kidney disease, we noticed that this population is actually disappearing with disease, and backing that up with the statistics, this end up being that CD90 population, which could suggest that maybe uh, losing that could be a hallmark of chronic kidney disease. Uh, and also, uh, one can look at the changes in the neighborhood distribution and then see that with disease now, uh, you're losing, for example, that CD90 population, but there's expansion of the immune and the telial neighborhood or expansion of the fibroblast neighborhood or of the myeloid neighborhood. And those could really inform us of what is expanding and where which cells they are interacting with based on these different proportions or cell types that we see. Finally, a word about uh, integration. I think they're all the, we're spending a lot of time uh, thinking about it, particularly in the KPMP uh, consortium to integrate uh, all these different technologies. And one of the ways we're working on is integrating some spatial transcriptomics, which inherently has the, has the cell, uh, single cell signature because there is a label transfer of these single cell into the spatial transcriptomics, along with protein imaging technologies and we're hoping also uh, in the future to integrate metabolomics and pathomics into one uh, analytical space where then one can not only explore the cell type based on gene expression, but also based on neighborhood interactions, the regulatory network and others. 
finally, I want to just thank uh, uh, the first uh, the funders, uh, the NID uh -huh. particularly, who are supporting uh, all our effort in KPMP Hub Map and the Kidney O'Brien. Uh, actually, the Common Fund is supporting our Hub Map effort, and uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, my uh, collaborator Seth Winfrey, who is now in University of Nebraska Medical Center, my colleagues at IU. Uh, Pierre Dagger, uh, Michael Eden, and uh, Sanjay Jain, my collaborator in HubMap, and also uh, my lab, half of whom uh, uh, are here, and they are they generated all this data that you saw. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. There was so much data in there. I wish we had more time to um, go go through it more. Um, there are several questions in the chat, so I'm going to go straight to the chat. Um, so the first question is, can you use this technique for biopsy of transplant kidney to have a to have better details about its health than what is done today? So for example, some centers do biopsy as part of the follow-up. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of, I think uh, there are many investigators that have reached out to us uh, to apply that. I mean, particularly for protocol biopsies, even those are even better because you, you don't just wait for a rejection event. So absolutely. I mean, these are, this is the goal really to apply this across the board. And next, we have a couple questions about the antibodies that are used. Um, do you use uh, consumer or I think custom antibodies on um, custom versus commercially available antibodies on your human kidney section on the reference panels? And if you do use custom antibodies, what uh, what quality controls do you use? Sure. Uh, so far, we're using mostly commercially available antibodies just because of the hassle of developing custom. Having said that, we have had success in developing a couple, couple of custom antibodies, and I think we have experience in that. I think uh, the key thing that, that was mentioned is really the validation. So I think there are several level of controls that we do. So we do, uh, you know, first of all, we want to make sure it works uh, on, um, uh, I mean, for immune cells, we, we look at immune organs, but also we look at the kidney because sometimes if you look at the, just the tonsil or the spleen, the antigen may be highly expressed there, but you want to also make sure that it's available in the tissue. Uh, and then we look at them also after conjugation. And sometimes we can get like a uh, few antibodies that used to work before conjugation stop to work after conjugation. So there is a pipeline and that's why I also refer to this OMAP uh, uh, reference where uh, you know, uh, all these antibodies with the catalog number and, and uh, you know, the clones uh, are available and also some of the data uh, that you can see the images also. So our next question is about the validated antibodies, but with respect to mouse tissue. So um, do they work with mouse tissue? And I guess I'll add, um, if not, do you have a panel that works with mouse tissue? Yeah, excellent question, yes. Uh, we had to develop a separate panel for the mouse tissue. There's only a few antibodies that will comfortably react. So we have, uh, like right now, a 32 plus uh, uh, kind of antibody panels uh, for, for the mouse tissue that will also do the same thing that will define structural uh, and uh, immune and also some a few cell states. So this is uh, not yet, I mean, I, I didn't have time to show it today, but but we do have that when current, currently we're also trying to move it to the to the paraffin uh, space also. Okay, and then we have uh, one more question. Um, may this technique be used for new type of urine analysis and or blood tests for rejection biomarkers? Again, talking about transplants. Well, I mean, I think this technique requires tissue. So in a way, I think if we if we get the tissue and hopefully uh, if we, for example, validate a marker uh, Two minutes. in the tissue, that will definitely lead hopefully to, you know, using this marker in the urine. For example, uh, in the in the work that I showed you on stones, we, we looked at uh, some markers that were uh, present uh, in the tissue. And then that led to uh, developing, for example, MMP7 and MMP9 as a, as a potential biomarkers in the for in the urine for stone patients, and I think a similar approach I think uh, would be to to do that. So there is, there is prognostic and also uh, information about uh, you know classifying patients and the pathophysiology of the disease and the tissue. But one of the uh, con consequences is hopefully leading to also some non-invasive biomarkers in in like liquid biopsies or the urine or others. So. We only have about a minute left, but we have one more question in the chat. So it asks if you can speak about the development of analytical tools for quantification and sterology. 
Uh, sure, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, this is kind of a lot of people are working on that. We have developed our own uh, uh, kind of a platform, it's called the VT, which is a plugin to ImageJ that will help uh, do, do the analysis uh, from, uh, uh, from segmentation to doing the quantification. I think this is an evolving thing. So there are uh, customized tools that are available, they're all open, and there's also uh, some tools that are developed by the community, and I think uh, uh, my suggestion is if if you have a tool that works for you that you're comfortable with, use it and ask for help. And we are we are available for help. So if you need uh, some tips or help with analysis, please reach out to us. And we're gonna be also our center is part of the new O'Brien Consortium. So that that help that technology will also be available there through that consortium. Thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. Um, and we will move to our third and final speaker of this session. Um, so our final speaker is Dr. Ha, a postdoctoral fellow in the Delling Lab at UCSF. She studies electric signaling in primary cilia using electrophysiology, and her research is centered around the function of polycystin complex within primary cilia of renal epithelial cells. Um, the title of her talk is 7-beta-27 dihydroxy cholesterol activates the heteromeric PC-1-2 polycystin complex. All right. Hello, do you guys see my slides well? Yes, we can. Okay, sounds good. Hi, hi from San Francisco. It's early in the morning here, and my name is Kotaji Ha, and I am currently a research associate at the Marcus Dellings Lab at UCSF. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially Dr. Terry Gwetznik. Um, I'm very happy that I can present my research here. So today my talk title is Cilia Specific Oxysterol 7-beta-7 DHC is required for polycystin complex. So yesterday I was in the meeting and then there were beautiful presentations about primary cilia and polycystin. So I'm pretty sure we're all experts now. So I decided to delete the introduction slide to save time. So let's just dive into the polycystin. Um, so I like to introduce the polycystin as a functional ion channel that permeates cation across the ciliary membrane. It's because PC1 and the PC2 form a functional ion channel in primary cilia. And as we all know, the mutations in PC2 and PC2 are responsible for ADPKD. So I'd like to briefly explain about the PC1 and the PC2 as, a, as an electrophysiologist. So PC2, the blue subunit in this cartoon, so trip channel subfamily PC2 is considered to form a functional ion channel with PC1, here's a yellow subunit, and then PC2 is also reported to form a homomeric ion channel in primary cilia, and this has been uh, well investigated by excellent electrophysiologists, Paul DeCan, Steve Clinton, and then Dr. Yong Yu also described the PC1 and PC2. He characterized the channel function in, in Woodside. Um, and PC1 is a super interesting. So it has 11 transmembrane domain, but also recognized by a lone large extracellular and terminus, which, which is cleaved at GPS site. So in 2018, the structure has finally released, but um, unfortunately, the end terminus structure is still missing out there because of the the size, the size is so big, and I, I think it's hard to purify the structure. So, um, so what's so special about that? It's just because the polycystin they form an ion channel in cilia, exclusively in cilia, and they conduct ion into the primary cilia. So, okay, so this is so cool, but to be honest, this is so unfortunate because they only permeate ion. That means that this channel is only active within primary cilia. So let's talk about ciliary patch clamp. So I really like to share a slide, and this is my favorite. So here is the hair-like organelle. Probably this is what you see. So let's talk about the size of primary cilia. 400 nanometer diameter, and then 
and the length is a five micrometer. So this is probably what you see from the papers, but I will show you what I see for a ciliary patch clamp. Do you guys detect the cilia in this slide? It's right here and then let's zoom in. It's, there it is, it's beautiful, but it's really hard to patch clamp. So I have to do this. So I have to grab this cilia using glass pipette to measure the polycystine activity. This is such a hassle and it's very difficult. So I had to come up with a new idea that, hey, we need to do better than this. So that's when we come up with a new idea. So we developed a new screen system to understand the polycystine complex for easy screening. So I, as I mentioned, the, um, the polycystine complex is only expressed in primary cilia. So we added the target sequence at the end terminus of PC1 and this target sequence enables the polycystine complex to traffic to the plasma membrane. So it's easier than patching the primary cilia. So to confirm the expression in the plasma membrane, we use the anti-HA tag and anti-flag tag and perform the surface expression. And then we observe the polycystine complex beautifully traffic to the plasma membrane. And also we confirm that polycystine complex traffic to the ciliary membrane as well as the plasma membrane. So now we have, we have established a stable cell lines that express a high level of these channels in the plasma membrane and also cilia. So using this technique, we reported that N terminus of PC1 is important for the polycystine complex to, uh, to conduct ion at the, at the cell membrane. So to measure the channel activation, we use the gain of function mutation F604P in PC2 subunit. This gain of function mutation was previously reported by Yongyu group to activate the polycystine complex. So using F604P, we unveiled that N terminus of PC1 is essential for the polycystine channel function in the membrane. But by contrast, the polycystine complex without N terminus did not activate the channel, although they traffic to the membrane. So this suggests that, that PC1 N terminus is essential component for the channel activation. So reported this to eLife in 2020. However, this study only raised a big major question for us. I mean, we really had to ask because we're a scientist here. So here's the major question. The polycystine, com uh, polycystine channel is active in the ciliary membrane. However, in the plasma membrane, uh, we need the gain of function mutations for channel activation. So that's when we ask the questions, why, what is the major difference between the ciliary membrane compared to the cell membrane? Why this makes a big difference? That's when we started to think about the lipid compartmentalization system within primary cilia. Some lipids are especially enriched within primary cilia, including P4 and then P4-5. But in addition, in 2018, the writer lab published amazing paper showing that some oxysterols are enriched within primary cilia. So, so we decided to test all the cholesterols and the lipids using our novel assay. So we did. We tested all the lipids and the cholesterol in hex cells expressing the polycystine complex using the whole cell patch clamp technique. We injected lipids and the cholesterols using glass electrode and measured the ion influx. Um, however, none of them activated the polycystine complex except 7-beta-27 DHC oxysterol. So what is oxysterol? So oxysterols are a group of oxidized derivatives of cholesterols, so typically formed through um, enzymatic or chemical processes. So they serve uh, important signaling molecules in, in cellular processes, including the regulation of cholesterol homeostasis and, and the immune responses. But um, there are still more to be investigated about the physiological role of oxysterol. So here we found that the 7-beta-27 activates 
the polycystin complex in the cell membrane as a wide type. Either PC1 or PC2 alone did not show any activations. But interestingly, uh, when we perfused the 7 beta 27 extracellularly, the channel was a silent, indicating that the oxysteryl binding site may be in the intracellular side of the polycystin complex. And then we also tested the dose dependent test. So the, di um, the different concentration of 7 beta 27, as you see here, we tested up to 50 micromole oxysteryl. And here we confirmed that 7 beta 27 activates uh, the polycystin complex as a dose dependent manner. So after determined that 7 beta 27 activates the polycystin complex, we ask how intracellular treatment of oxysterol um, activates the polycystin complex, but why not extracellular oxysterol? So luckily, there are studies that uh, uh, from the Kravit lab and then Samlo lab showing that the PC2 is the only treat channel that was pulled as a sterile binding protein. So maybe PC2 is a lipid binding protein. So we decided to perform a molecular dynamics simulations to compute the lipid binding site of PC2. So using this simulation, we selected arginine 581 and glutamate 208 in PC2 as a potential lipid binding amino acid residues and mutated this um, amino acid into alanine to remove the charge effect. So um, interestingly, when we mutated these mutations into alanines, uh, they were still managed to traffic to primary cilia right here. They're beautifully trafficked, but um, the mutant did not induce any channel activation in primary cilia, indicating that these two amino acids play a key role to form a lipid binding site in PC2. So these two amino acids are crucial for oxysterol dependent activation of the polycystin complex. So we also tested the specificity of 7 beta 27 binding to the polycystin complex. So we know it could bind. So we want to see how specific it, it should be binding. So we found other oxysterols that have a similar structures as a 7 beta 27, 7 alpha 27, 7 beta, and 7 alpha. However, none of them induce the channel activation. So this shows that the location of hydroxyl groups of 7 beta 27 right here, they're highlighted in red, is important for binding to the PC2 subunit. So here's the first summary. So um, 7 beta 27 oxysterol activates the polycystin complex in the membrane, and it also binds to the intracellular side of PC2. And uh, glutamate 208 and arginine 581 of PC2 is important for a lipid binding site of PC2. So what about cilia then? Now we got to ask, so we see that from the membrane and then what about cilia here? So in order to test oxysterol binding to primary cilia, here is the approach that I took excise the ciliary patch clamp. It's like really difficult, but I, eh, again, it, but it's doable. So here's the cilia expressing the polycystin complex. And then I grab the cilia with the glass pipette and then pull it. By doing that, intras, intraciliary side of the membrane is exposed to the bath solution. And I add the oxysterol into the bath solution. So by doing that, we were able to test oxysterol with the ciliary membrane. And interestingly, so intracellular treatment of 7 beta 27 further potentiate the ciliary ion channel. This raised an um, interesting possibility that oxysterol functions uh, as a second messenger in primary cilia. So as you can see, they activated compared to just wire type um, cilia. Now, collectively, we showed that 
uh, the oxysterol is crucial for the polycystine activation. But what happens, there is no oxysterol synthesized in primary cilia. So there's a paper published in 2021 showing that oxysterol synthesizing enzyme HSD11B are localized in proximal tubules and collecting duct. So we inhibited the enzymatic activity using carbonoxalone, a component of licorice, to inhibit the oxysterol synthesis. And here is the result. So we incubated IMCD cells in carbonoxalone for 24 hours and 72 hours each. And as you can see, 24 hours carbonoxalone incubation significantly, significantly reduced the channel activation. And then 72 hours incubation led to the channel inactivation. It was completely inactivated. So we suggested that inhibition of the oxysterol synthesis result in the impaired channel activity. So here's the final summary. So using the target sequence, we were able to traffic and then target the polycystic complex to the ciliary membrane, but also the cell membrane. And then we hypothesize that ciliary oxysterols bind to the polycystin complex. And that's how the polycystin ion channel within primary cilia can be active. But when we artificially inject the oxysterol into the cell, they also bind to the polycystins that express in the cell membrane, and it can also permeate the ions. And then when we inhibit the enzymatic activity using carbonoxalone, we observed that um, the ciliary ion channel does not function anymore. So um, I hope this study helped us to find a way to regulate the polycystin channel uh, so we can develop a therapeutic target for ADPKD in the future. So um, I'd like to thank my lab, uh, my lab mates and my mentors and then my colleagues. So I'd like to thank Dr. Marcus Delling, wonderful mentor. He helps me all the time. And then I'd like to thank my lab mates, Nadine and Aide. They helped me to perform the experiment. And I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially Dr. Jamie Ryder and then Dr. Gabrielle Lope. They always come up with a great discussions. And then I'd like to also thank Dr. Mian Park, my wonderful mentor so that I can navigate my research career. So thank you so much for your attentions and, and I'm open uh, to ask uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much. So I'll stop share the slide now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ha, for that, that fascinating talk. Uh, we have several questions so far in the chat. The first is, have you checked if there are ADPKD causing mutations in PKD2 at either E208 or at R581, the um, oxysterol binding sites in humans? So if those are mutated in humans, are they um, disease causing? Really good question. So I actually checked it. So there are pathogenic variants around that area, but not specifically uh, those two amino acids. But also I couldn't find the normal variant at that site either. So normal people don't carry this variant. And then the pathogenic variant, mm, I, I didn't see it yet. So maybe they're not reported or maybe they're too lethal, but still it's open, yeah. Um, our next question is, does 7-beta-27 activate homotetrameric PC2 channels? That's also um, sharp questions. So um, I haven't checked it yet. So I'm, I'm planning to patch clamp the PC1 knockout cilia with um, oxysterol for the, for the revision. I'm planning to do it, so I'll answer that later. <laughs> Great, thank you. And can the oxysterol activate the complex that is missing the N-terminus of PC1? We didn't, we tried that. Um, have you tried docking with the structure of the PC1, PC2 complex instead of the PC2 homotetramer? We're actually trying that right now, but, um, but it's really hard to see the bound form. 
I think there is a technical uh, difficulties, but we're trying it right now. And do you see different results if you patch on different regions of the kidney, i.e. like the distal versus the, oh, excuse me, different regions of the cilium, the distal versus the proximal region of the cilium? Well, I haven't patched other regions, so I cannot answer that. Yeah. That could be interesting. Um, yeah. I think so. um, the next question is, does the patch clamp technique detect activity from single ion channel or multiple channels? Good questions. So the wholesale patch clamp, I can um, detect and observe uh, countless channels expressing the whole cells. But then single cell patch clamp, you are specifically aiming for one channel to investigate the dynamics of the channel itself. So I only see one channel when I do the single channel. But when I do the whole cell, I'm pretty sure there are like millions of ion channels opening at the same time. And how do you check the stoichiometry of the PC1, PC2 complexes on the membrane and on the cilium? And is it always one to three? Good questions. So um, the polycystin the channel, yeah, structure is very complicated. So far it's reported to one to three, but some also suggested that there could be a more available structure arrangement as well. So with the patch clamp so far, I just detect a uniform uh, channel dynamics. So we think that it's a one to three. And then I haven't uh, detected any other different dynamics, but it will be super interesting. Great. Um, the next uh, set, question says, is anything known about what might regulate the flipping of the oxysterol across the membrane into the cilium, or is this process spontaneous? I'm really, really willing to try that. So um, so flipping oxysterol, there should be an enzyme that could possibly do that, but I don't I haven't seen it yet, or I haven't found any um data about that. So if we can do it, uh, if we can knock out that enzyme that can flip the oxysterol, then it will be very interesting test to do it. So we can prove our hypothesis. Yeah. So if you um, know, then please let us know so that we can try to inhibit that flipping enzyme or we can try to like overexpress that to see if we can get more oxysterol. That'll be super interesting. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can squeeze in this last question. Uh, do you have any evidence or thoughts as to the involvement of the OSBP proteins, for example, OSBPL8? Oh, um, I think I uh, can you please enlighten me? I'm a pot. I think I haven't heard about that protein. Sorry. Yeah, I think we're out of time. There are a couple of questions left in the chat, so maybe um, Dr. Ha can uh, uh, answer those in the chat. So we that concludes this session. Thank you so much to all of our fantastic speakers. Um, I believe there is a five minute break, but we're three minutes early. So um, that would put you at coming back, I believe, at um, 1120 um, Eastern time. Um, thank you. Thank you so much.